Welcome to The Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm Dean Detloff. I'm a PhD student at the Institute for Christian Studies in Toronto, Ontario. And I'm a Catholic, and I'm a communist, and I uh, research all your favorite things. <laughs> Sorry, man, I can never do this <laughs> straight face. <laughs> I'm Matt. I teach media studies and uh, communication at Greenville University in Greenville, Illinois. Uh, I research cultural theory, media archaeology, and I am some kind of strange Marxist, as you'll find out in this episode. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a good kind. It's a good kind of strange. Stranger Marxists is the title of my new Netflix pitch. <laughs> I'd watch that show. <laughs> um, yeah, so this week we'll keep the intro short because we had the uh, the immense privilege of chatting with Catherine from another podcast called Friendly Anarchism, and this is a joint episode between the two of us, so we don't want to monopolize too much this time. Uh, we do want to say, though, that we're going to make a Christmas episode. It's not this one. It's going to be next week, Christmas week. Um, Post-Christmas post-christmas but we don't know what the episode's about <laughs> so you could give us a great gift uh by telling us what you think it should be about what What are some good communist christmas things that we don't know about or should know about um until then we're gonna keep on thinking about it but not too hard uh, instead we're just gonna go right over to our conversation with Catherine. and uh by the way again friendly anarchism that's a podcast that you should 100 percent check out there are other lefty christians in this world uh and it's also so good. Catherine is it's so good um and she she's got that good anarchist balance uh for all you all you anarchists that are always in our mentions being like why don't you talk about anarchism more often? Well, now we don't have to. We're, Catherine's doing it, so <laughs> go, uh, go, just listen to her do it. She does a better job. That's really offensive, anarchist voice. <laughs> is it? <laughs> well, I don't think it's okay. It, it's offensive for those anarchists to show up in my mentions all the time, you know. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Cool. <laughs> So this week on the Magnificast, we have Catherine from Friendly Anarchism, a very cool podcast that Matt and I just learned about uh, just this past week. And it's really exciting because for a long time, uh, we we mistakenly thought that we were the only uh, Christian leftist podcast out there in the world. And good news for us and everyone else, that is not true. Uh, there is another one, at least one more. Who knows? There could be <laughs> there could be others out there on the horizon um we we can only hope i guess uh but maybe just a way to start off Catherine, could you um say something a little bit about yourself uh what you do what you're trying to do with the podcast and uh what's your deal sure yeah so i started this podcast um with a friend back in april of last year so it's been going for a little while now just about to do i guess this is going to be the 30th episode so that's really exciting. Um, I'm a Quaker. Wow, I'm congratulations. Fairly, I'm fairly new to Christianity. I've, I found Christ like 15 months ago, I guess, 16 months ago at this point. Um, but wow. I was an anarchist before that, and I found that the two meshed together very, very well. And so I wanted to kind of share that vision and that um, my way of moving through the world with other people and see if there's other people that are, are interested in it. And I have found an interest, especially in sort of the mystic nature of, um, specifically sort of Quakerism is a mystic faith. And, um, so yeah, so the podcast has been great. It's given me a chance to talk to all sorts of really interesting people about all sorts of really interesting things. Um, I feel like spirituality and anarchism both tie into basically anything so you can, I, I feel like I can talk to pretty much anybody and have those two things inform the conversation. Uh, it's been a really, really exciting project and wonderful project. And it has felt a little bit lonely, though, out in Christian anarchist land. So it's pretty exciting to find out about you, too. That was really cool. Yeah, it's so neat. Um, so you made 30 episodes or so, and uh, I listened to a few of them today, and I like them so much. Um, is there an episode that you really like or that sticks out to you? Um or, like, that you'd want people to start with if they're just going to find your podcast now? Well, it's so funny. One of the least favorite episodes, the one that doesn't get ever listened to, is one of my favorite. Yeah. Um, it's Love, Anger, and Mutual Aid with Barb Ryan. And the reason I like it so much is um, because one of the goals of my podcast is education. 
and teaching people about anarchism and sort of um, making it less scary for people, especially sort of black block Antifa type praxis and work. Yeah. So what happened with that episode is Barb Ryan is very liberal and sort of uh, very, very, in a liberal sense, nonviolent and spent pretty much the first... She's a lovely lady, which is why I had her on the show. Um, but she did spend sort of like the first 20 minutes of the podcast trying to like reform me, <laughs> like bring me back oh, no. <laughs> from, oh, no. the, from the dark and side. And she succeeded, I guess. That's the short, short podcast. Yeah. So it's just like it's sort of, I mean, it's an hour, it's an hour long podcast. So basically I can understand somebody listening to this podcast being like, what is this? This is terrible. You know what I mean? Like, cause she has a lot of, inter- but, but basically, but basically, um, it was really great to talk to her because she was open-minded, but it can take a while for people to warm up to new ideas. And um, by the end of the podcast, she's saying like, oh, those black block anarchists are just trying to protect their grandmas. And like, and, uh, <laughs> you know, so she made kind of a 180 in that show. And I was really proud of being able to talk to somebody that I didn't agree with. And then we kind of like came to a place of, agreement and she had a better understanding of who I am and what I do and like I feel like that kind of information sort of ripples outwards so it's it's so that particular episode is one of the ones I'm proudest of because it shows the most development and the mo in in sort of my um my ability to speak to people and explain anarchism to people in a way that's accessible and effective so I was just really really proud of uh, proud of that one but it is hard to listen to at the beginning before it starts to warm up. You know, it starts getting really good around 40 minutes in. So, like, that's, um, it's a lot. <laughs> you know, it's a different kind of, it's a different kind of show. Dang. That, that's so cool, though. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. I, I really want to listen to that because I'm curious to kind of follow someone's journey, I guess, uh, being converted. <laughs> uh, or at least, you know, slowly understanding something that is sort of unfairly represented. That's uh, super cool. That's way more mature than anything we've ever thought of doing on this yeah. podcast. Also, like, what a cool thing that you, <laughs> what a cool thing that you, like, I don't know, had a podcast, had a conversation with somebody, and then just kind of, like, let it all hang and, like, and just and then just post it even though maybe like the beginning like wasn't wasn't the greatest you just kind of like stuck with it and let it um let it all be that's like such a cool thing sometimes podcasts you know don't want to have like any type of like weird negative content on them and i think that um that if you're real about it that's really neat yeah it's a it's a discussion you know so the the format of my podcast is as a discussion and one of these things and to, to tackle difficult conversations and difficult conversations can take a while to warm up, you know, so it's like, they're in mm-hmm. there, so the podcast is one piece, you know, it's not, it's not like a series of interview questions or, um, you know, or like piece, you know, some podcasts have like different sections or whatever, like my one, one episode of my podcast is one entire piece that needs to be sort of seen together as one, as you can see the the so you, you can see the character arc kind of or like the arc of development of these like long form deep conversations because it takes a while to go deep into a subject you know so it's like the the podcasts yeah. tend to always start getting the best at halfway through you know start getting to the really good content especially you know I want to talk to people that aren't necessarily um well professional interviewees you know so like people come on the show and they're just people you know so like it's kind of scary to be on a show and it can take a while for them to get comfortable in front of the mic and stuff but all that stuff is interesting and valid to me so I leave it all in um you know and like that I really like the episode with Adam I don't know how to say his last name Visa I think he's this uh like super sweet Quaker anarchist up in North Dakota and he was kind of nervous at the beginning of it and it was like a little bit slow warming up but he just had beautiful insights and like some of them came out didn't come out till 10 minutes before the end of the show you know what I mean so it's like I hope that people yeah, yeah. sort of stick with it you know when they're listening to their podcast because it can kind of like chugga, 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 you know what I mean like it takes a minute for people to kind yeah. of warm up man that's such a cool um idea behind podcasting I I don't know Dean and I, I think um I don't know. We're not that deep of thinkers about it. <laughs> That's really like a like a cool explanation, though. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, 
Dang, I feel like I have so many questions just based on uh, the first less than ten minutes of this conversation. So uh, we are, <laughs> we're, it's not, the, we're breaking the mold here. We're not waiting till the very end. We're, uh, we're just coming out of the <laughs> gate with all the good stuff. Um, uh, all right, so we're gonna talk about a bunch of cool stuff. Um, one thing I'm just gonna flag in the beginning so that we don't forget to talk about it later because I will 100% forget to is uh, <laughs> so our podcast, The Magnificast, is named after Mary Song, The Magnificat. Uh, is what it's sometimes called. Um, that's a weird way of saying it, but I'm emphasizing there's no S in it. Uh, and uh, we've never talked about it on the podcast ever, which is, I don't know, not great. Dumb, um, dumb and of us. Now it's it's like almost Christmas, so we're we're obligated. I feel like to to address it. So I'd love to hear what you think about that later uh, in the in the latter half of the show. But in the beginning, I guess I'm just super curious about. Uh, you were saying so you you've been a christian for like a little more than a year and then you were an anarchist before that and i'm just like dying to know more about that uh like what's the deal with that what what was your anarchism like before that and then how did you get involved in christianity and then how has that sort of been uh developing for you yeah sure so um i was just i was a punk kid back in the day um been hating cops since I was like 14, <laughs> even, you know, earlier, <laughs> um, <laughs> running around vandalizing shit. I don't know. Oh my gosh. Are you, do you have a, it, this isn't live. I do not I can swear, right? <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry. Yeah. This is a podcast for, a, it's PG-13 podcast for okay. sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, you know, so like I culturally as a, as a teenager and sort of young adult, just hung out with a lot of anarchists and. Um, at the time, back in the day, it was more of a cultural thing and not so political, but I was learning about the politics and learning about the theory, and then, um, my life got derailed a little bit by mental illness. I talked about that in one of my episodes, my radical vulnerability episode, but when I started kind of doing better again, and then politics had started to really heat up in this country and just around the world, I mean, it's always been there, right? But, you know, I mean, everybody sort of has slowly had sort of a, a political awakening in the last couple of years. You know, so I was part of that too, and it sort of I delved yeah. back into my anarchist roots and all that theory that I've always believed is very true that everybody is equal and that an anarchist society would be the most ideal one, that people are the most invested in their lives when they have some kind of direct control over the decisions that affect their lives, and that the idea that politics is separate from life is just a false dichotomy. Is it false dichotomy? You know, so like. <clears throat> So, but when that, at the same time, as this sort of like political awakening came along with a cultural awakening and sort of everybody being like, oh shit, the world's pretty fucked up. <laughs> this is, like we're, you know, with climate change and with like rising authoritarianism and stuff, it became more clear that like, wow, things are actually going really badly. <laughs> you know, I was part yeah. of the, I was part of the Bernie Sanders campaign and I was in Philadelphia for the DNC, um, um, with some of the Oregon delegates. I wasn't a delegate, but I was with them. And um, just sort of, like, fighting at the gates there, I just was like, I think that if it's not Bernie, it's going to be Trump. So I just was like, I just need to do everything in my possible power to do that. But I gotten, so I got sort of, a lot of people got, I got sucked back up into electoral politics for one second, being like, maybe this can work, maybe Bernie can save us, you know. But then, as is the huge, um, electoral politics doesn't work. The state... <laughs> And corruption, capitalist corruption, overtook that. You know what I mean? And um, I was at that point, I was like, yeah, no, anarchy for reals. Anarchy for reals. But then while I was in, <laughs> you know, so, like, I kind of, like, came back around, like, ah, yeah, no, that's the, that's the thing that needs to happen and was always the thing that needed to happen. And then at that time, when I was in Philadelphia, you know, Philadelphia is, like, a, a really important place for Quakers. It's a... Uh, and so I went to the Socialist Convergence, and I went to the People's Convention were both held in Quaker meeting houses, and I'd never been in a Quaker meeting house before. And they're beautiful. You know, they're very simple, but very calm. You know, very, have like a really mm -hmm. rich mm -hmm. air to them. Like a lot of, a lot of spiritual spaces. You know, I'm really interested in um, spiritual and religious spaces, I think, are really important. And um, that hold that energy, that hold that spirit energy. And I felt that really strongly in those meeting houses, and I felt like there was a need for it, like I felt God there, you know, and I didn't realize that I needed that until I felt it, you know what I mean? 
And then, um, mm-hmm. so I, I, when I, when I got back home from the DNC, I was like, I should go check that out. Cause like, I felt, a, I felt something happen to me in that space. You know what I mean? Like something that I need. And so when I went to meeting, my first meeting was incredibly powerful. Like I just, I just, I came to Jesus right then. Basically, I didn't know who Jesus was, but I found, <laughs> I found some kind of, I found God in some, some sense. I found a like really strong spiritual heart that I didn't know I had really. And then it was like, started to already just fill up my life right there in this hole that had been just fear. Um, and so then I got, I got hooked and then actually slowly learning more about the, the history of the Quaker church as a Christian with a, as a Christian base and like thinking about, um, how people look at spirituality and saying that a lot of people, white people tend to, uh, are around, especially like liberals and the people, um, in sort of like hippie liberal progressive land tend to appropriate other religious cultures for their spiritual needs. And I was like, well, you know, historically and like traditionally my family is Christian. Quakerism that I found is Christian. I should look into that. You know what I mean? Like that seems to be like the appropriate starting space. And then it felt just entirely right. And like the more I read about Jesus, the more I'm like, I super want to be this guy's friend. He's way rad. Um, <laughs> like, and so this is fantastic. And so then like the last journey has been me sort of the last few like year and a bit has been me just sort of my faith just continuing to deepen and like how it ties in with my anarchist praxis has been just phenomenal in deepening my faith and deepening my ability to my understanding of how to be an anarchist and like what that praxis is all about learning about being you know trying to stay humble but keep perspective and like always living in service and always um it's so it's the, the two things tied together have been an incredibly f- strong force in my life, and I feel like the m- the deeper I get into anarchist pra- practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. That's like such a cool uh, cool story. Um, I like every bit of that. <laughs> That's such a, a great perspective. Well, um, yeah, yeah. So um, you're an anarchist first and then you're a Christian, which is really fun, um, a fun distinction. I'm glad that you shared that with us because um, I know in both of Dean and I's lives, um, we had, I guess, anarchist phases that I think were not as very, not as cool as yours, uh, for sure. Not that you're, not that you, (laughs) like, um, I think, well, but I think the problem is that we were Christians first and then anarchists. I think if we had the other way around, we'd be better. (laughs) I've noticed that. I feel like I'm, I feel like. I'm the only Christian anarchist at this point that I've met that was an anarchist first. Everybody else was Christian first. So it's like, I'm coming from kind of a different place, which is, I think, and which is interesting. Yeah, that's one thing I've really appreciated about your, your podcast, actually. Um, it, it feels like, I don't know, uh, in, our, in my experience anyway, a lot of Christian anarchism uh, knows a, a lot about Christianity and uses that language to kind of make... I don't know, interesting rhetorical moves against the state or, you know, corrupt kingdoms or whatever. And that's like cool. Uh, But a lot of Christians call themselves anarchists without really knowing that much about anarchism as like a a real uh, political ideology that organizes materially in the world. And uh, I was so pumped to find your podcast because you're like out there actually doing stuff for real and you know uh, things about anarchism and Christianity alike. And I just feel like it's really refreshing to kind of hear somebody inhabit both of those worlds really amphibiously and not <laughs> sort of superficially. And not that all Christian anarchists are that way by any means, but um, like I was for sure. When yeah, I was me younger. too. Same. So it's same, like, same. it's, it's cool to hear something a little more sophisticated. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, on, on that note, um, could you just maybe tell us about anarchism a little bit? Like what about it appeals to you? What's, what's your entry point to anarchism? Um, why do you think that's sort of a political um, ideology or maybe lack thereof that is worth, um, investigating? Yeah. So, um, basically anarchism at its root is just direct democracy, like actual full democracy. Um, I speak about this a lot, how the right is super comfortable with full authoritarianism, you know, just straight up fascism and having one person at top and having all the power and wealth and money at the very top. And then Everybody else gives up their power to that state and to that, you know. But then, for some reason, the left is really uncomfortable with full democracy. It's like, we don't actually believe 
that it works. Like, we, we do believe that authoritarian in some way, we believe that authoritarianism works, um, but don't actually believe in humans. Like, don't actually believe that humans have the capability of taking care of themselves. That we are all sheep that need, uh, a, you know, to be led, and that we all, that basically humans are stupid and incapable, and we need somebody smarter and capable to, to tell us what to do, or else society will fall apart. And I just, I just wholeheartedly reject that, that, um, premise. I just, I just don't think it's true. I think what's happening, what we're seeing is authoritarians have very cleverly taught us to think that way, to disempower us so that they can just have the power themselves and do whatever they want, you know? So it's like the myth that humans are incapable of taking care of themselves is what holds up this like really oppressive authoritarian capitalist structure, you know? So what anarchists say is that that is that we are totally capable if we are empowered to um, take care of ourselves and our lives in like and so that requires a more local structure, you know that requires working on smaller scales, um, which is hard with like which can be hard sometimes, um, but when people have direct control over their lives, then they are invested and they do it. You know what I mean? Like that's one of the critiques is like well nobody's going to do it. It takes too much work. It's like that's not true. If people actually have control over the decisions in their lives, then they are invested and they do it. You know, like consensus process can be slow and painful, but when it, you can feel that you're materially making a difference in your own and your neighborhoods and your community lives, you know, it, it does happen and it's really beautiful. And I think at our very core, humans are kind and good and want to take care of each other and that all of this sort of like horrible shit is basically comes from the corruptive nature of power and wealth, which is something that Christ talks about a lot. He just warns us over and over again, you know, like wealth is corruptive, you know, power is corruptive, institutions are corruptive, and like taking that message is, well, if you get rid of all of those, then people are basically good, you know? So like, that's why, that's why anarchism for me. I don't know if that, do I, I don't know if that yeah. makes too much sense. <laughs> no, that makes, ma makes tons of sense. That's great. Um, on, on that same point though, so I like what you said about democracy. That's also what really appeals to me about lots of leftism is that I do believe in democracy as well. And it's very nice. Um, it's very nice and good when it happens. Um, I guess like one of the problems is that, uh, we have such a short sighted view of what democracy even actually is. Like, um, I don't know, people, uh, in the United States say that they live in a democratic society, but really it's not the case. I mean, we vote every once in a while and we say that's democracy. So, um, could you even say a little bit more about that? Like, what is it, uh, what does democracy mean for anarchists that might be a little bit different for, uh, liberals or conservatives or whatever? Sure. So one of the things we talk about is, um, libertarian municipalism is one way of doing it or, um, democratic confederalism. And these are different systems that work on like the local neighborhood council level or what level. So, um, you try and reach consensus as much as possible, and consensus means that everybody involved in the effect of a decision or in a decision um, agree to something, and they, so there's full consent of everybody involved. So that is, like, actual democracy means one voice, one vote, right? So, like, actual, full <coughs> democracy means that every single person involved in a decision was part of making that decision. And, is you know, and so, like... Um, and not just on a 50, 50, you know, 51, 49% majority that like consensus doesn't just mean everybody's forced to degree or that you vote in like the majority things like true consensus means that everybody has come to the table with their ideas and built something together that everyone can agree on, you know? So that is what democracy is. And it takes more time. People are problematic. <laughs> like humans are difficult, but the idea that it means we're too difficult to be able to actually have democracy, real democracy, I, again, I just reject. You know, at one point people said, oh, no, you can't possibly have republics, you can't possibly have um, even, like, electoral democracy, we have to have monarchs, you know? Like, the whole society, everybody, it'll all fall apart without a monarch. And, like, we now know that that's not true. Like, people have fairly successfully, I mean, there's obviously lots of problems, but fairly successfully created systems of uh, republics, and um, close to democracies, you know what I mean? So it's like the myth of the um, monarch is the same myth of the, us having to have a republic or an electoral system to get stuff done. Yeah, thanks. That's always my favorite part about anarchism and like um, 
less authoritarian leftist ideology is just the emphasis on um on like collective decision making i think those are such like fun and um worthwhile procedures that people just don't take the time to do because they are they are difficult or they can be painful um that's cool yeah i guess then it makes sense then uh how you see your uh your political ideology and quakerism kind of uh together because there's uh, a lot of good confluence between those ideas yeah there's a lot of overlap too in quaker praxis and anarchist praxis because when they both come from the idea that every person has a direct connection to power be it political or spiritual then um, similar processes of making decisions just arise naturally out of that space, even if they're not like, you know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, Quakers work yeah. by consensus generally. Yeah, that's right. I was going to I was gonna say that. That's, that. That is correct, though, right? Quakers do use consensus decision-making in their meetings? Yes. Mm-hmm. Dang, that's neat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it is really neat. I appreciate to... Uh... <clears throat> Like Matt, I think um, one great thing about anarchism and democracy is that it kind of does a really good job at giving the law to when people say that they're being democratic, because uh, in most cases they're not. Like, yeah. uh, we live in allegedly democratic societies, right? But those democratic societies have to impose their rule uh, over and over and over by policing actual crowds, uh, uh, actual, actual gatherings of peoples. Right. Um, even when they find a, a unified voice. So uh, it's nice to have anarchists, <clears throat> excuse me, it's nice to have anarchists who are able to, I guess, uh, I don't know, just force people to get clear about what they mean when they say what they say. Yeah, I mean, the I, the problem with the state is that it's illegitimate. <laughs> is that what be, with the state to exist needs to get everybody on board with the myth that we need the state. You know, they don't, they, so they don't, they don't want people to understand that actually we don't need this state. We don't need these oppressive state structures to survive because then they lose all of their power. You know what I mean? So it's like part of what our message is telling people, you don't need cops. Like you don't need these sorts of like bureau, you don't need these bureaucracies. You don't need these electoral systems and these like leaders to function and like, the power of the state does not want people to know that. Yeah, I guess that leads into the other helpful contribution of uh, a lot of anarchists too, uh, direct action, that Mm -hmm. um, you don't need the the state to do it, you can do it yourself. Um, I appreciate that. Yeah, direct action is really important. It's like, talk is cheap, just fucking do it. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. (laughs) You know, people are scared. They don't think they can do it. You know, they've completely been disempowered. And it's like, no, yeah, you can just fucking do it. (laughs) <laughs> you can do yeah. you can do all things through christ who gives you strength um yeah, it's in go. the bible so <laughs> that, i think that's the uh that's the direct action bible verse if i recall <laughs> yeah it's good. It's good. yeah in the uh in direct action study bible that one's highlighted <laughs> <laughs> that's good um so we mentioned this a few times on our podcast and I guess we'll do it again right now. Um, Dean and I were both uh, college age Christian first, then Christian anarchists. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I appreciate that time in my life. There was like a lot of good things that happened there, but I think that my biggest problem was that I was reading people who were Christian anarchists and not just anarchists. Mm. Um, because, sort of different different sort of uh types of discourse different types of values that are being um brought up in both yeah and um hearing you talk is very is very great because you've got all the good stuff and none of the bad stuff (laughs) um so uh i think well so the very first episode of the magnificast which is extremely bad and i wouldn't uh, i wouldn't want anyone to really listen to it uh we did was (laughs) was about christian anarchism uh, about and and Jacques Ellul. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar. He's not great. If you're not familiar, don't take the time to go read it. <laughs> uh, <Yeah. laughs> yeah, I mean, there's some there's some redeeming qualities for sure, but y- you know, he's not. He's like no Bakunin or something. I don't know. Uh, anyways, so we talked a lot about uh, Jacques Ellul and um, and his Christian anarchism, and I think that um, the way that Jacques Ellul's Christian anarchism sort of manifests is the same way that it manifested for Dean and I and how it does for a lot of people who are Christians first and then anarchists. Um, and all of that to say, like, the main um, objection that Alul has to the state um, and in favor of anarchism is that, like, the state uses violence and that he thinks Christians, like, have to be pacifists. Mm. But, like, 
in a very sort of liberal framework. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is like the longest segue ever to get to this one point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, on previous episodes of your podcast, you've talked a lot about violence, and they've been extremely rich and great discussions. Thank you. Um, the, the one that you had uh, with uh, uh, Hay last week was really great. Um, there's this part in the podcast when you said like um, – that that Jesus Jesus's life and ministry was like escalating moments of like uh, class warfare or something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which I which I really like that idea. I never really thought about it that way. Anyways, what's what are your thoughts on violence and Christianity and anarchism? Um, I uh, it seems apparent to me that you have some different ideas other than just pacifism is the only way forward or something. Yeah. So, um, there's a false equivalency between sort of small acts of violence against property or acts of self-defense or community defense and the idea of violently overthrowing a state, right? So, like, when we're talking about nonviolent revolution and revolutionary praxis versus violent revolution, anarchists do not want violent revolution, right? So, like, that's that's sort of a communist idea, that you have to, like, take up arms and, like, overthrow the state. Because the problem with that, which is we see over and over again all over the world, is that what you end up with when you do things that way, when you do it that, like, violent way, like violent coups and, like, just tons of, like, murdering all of your oppressors kind of deal, is you end up with dictatorships again. You know, like, you, 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 you take out power without, un- without actually re-empowering the people from the bottom, then it just, that void will just get filled probably with somebody worse, you know? So... Um, Jesus's praxis is sort of one of the first, I think, showing how to change the world without just murdering all of your monarchs and dictators, right? So it's like, it's brilliant. Like, he's super fucking smart. It's like, he knows what he's doing. (laughs) And so, so when we talk about violence, um, people are like, don't, like, we have to be nonviolent. It's like, I totally agree, but what your definition of violence is, is um, very narrow and not really considering the realities of what it means to live in a violent world. You know what I mean? So, like, the idea of, like, total total pacifism, including never protecting yourself or, like, defending yourself, you know, the idea that you just need to take a punch, um... I think is not fair and what ends up happening is you end up with the people who are the most vulnerable supposed to just get beaten and killed in the name of nonviolence. you know like a lot of people spouting like never ever fight are the people that are never probably gonna have to (laughs) right um and and so um and you talk about jesus didn't fight back and it's like, yeah, he was Jesus. Like, <laughs> I, I, you know, like, we're not all, we're not all Jesus. You know what I mean? Like, he, if you want to be a revolutionary martyr, then that's a path. But you better be as cool as Jesus to pull that shit off. You know what I mean? Like, that's sort of, like, how I feel about it. My, my, um, yeah, so, you know, I mean, like, so, like, Jesus comes down hard on pr- property over people problems, right? When the, when the, um, the sheep falls in the hole and he's, you know, um, or no, sorry. Uh, see, this is the part where I'm like more, I know more about anarchism than Christianity. The story where he goes and heals, where he heals, the, heals the man in the church and in the cynic, yeah. in, in temple. And then people are like, you can't do that. And he's like, you would have taken care of a sheep, you know? So like, that's pretty basically yeah, yeah. saying, like, you care more about this Starbucks window than you do about, like, people getting murdered in the street by cops daily. You know what I mean? And sort of, like, pointing that kind of thing out. And so, in Jesus flipping tables and stuff, it's like, and, like, like assaulting bankers and assaulting people, it's like, because you care more about this person's minor well-being at this moment than the fact that this system is killing and hurting and screwing over huge numbers of people like what's happening in this temple right now is immoral and needs to stop immediately because it is doing active harm you know what i mean so he's saying like 
if something is doing active harm right now or upholding a system that does active harm right now, it's okay to make a strong statement against that if that includes like he needed to clear out the temple right now to at that moment stop the harm that was happening because people were being taken advantage of at that particular moment and nobody was paying attention. You know what I mean? And that is very, very different than like taking up arms and murdering rulers. You know what I mean? So it's like, I am totally on board with Jesus's form of nonviolence which I would consider nonviolence, which I consider anarchist praxis, because anarchists don't want violence. Like, that is false. That is not true. You know what I mean? The idea that's like, people are afraid of anarchists and afraid of, because we're gonna go, like, just take up arms and kill everybody. It's like, that's not our deal. <laughs> like, go talk to a tanky. That's, <laughs> right. like, it's not what we do. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, like, like Antifa would well, not be out like, there uh, if there weren't so... Nazis, you know? Yeah, totally. No, that's good. Um, I feel like we should say something about violence a little bit, um, because uh, I, I wouldn't describe myself as a tanky per se, but we do talk about violence in a um, a slightly different way on our podcast. Anyhow, maybe this is like a good a good time to talk talking about like Marxism and anarchism, yeah, sure, and how they relate to Christianity. Like, um, yeah, I think. Uh, I really appreciate so much of what has transpired in terms of public dialogue about violence with people like Antifa out there kind of painting this really cool self-defense picture. Mm -hmm. Like that's a really good brand that people can get behind. I feel like in a really yeah. understandable thing. Um, and that's so good. Uh, <laughs> but another thing that Matt and I kind of have noticed in like uh, our studying and talking with other folks and um, I guess our own kind of development is like, so often in the world, uh, oppressed peoples have felt the need to turn to a more kind of active form of revolutionary violence in yeah. order to uh, change the system that they're part of. Uh, and so many Christians around the world have found in Jesus uh, a kind of motivating figure, I guess, for that. Yeah. Which is like really hard to sort out because it is true that Jesus didn't, um, he didn't like uh, start a violent coup in Rome or something like that. Um, but you get these weird sayings from like Catholic priests in Colombia, like Camilo Torres, who says like, if Jesus were alive, he would be a gorilla. And then Torres went and like joined the rebels in the jungle. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. It, it's really complicated. It's like a really tough thing to start out as a Christian on the left in general, I guess. Uh, yeah. but it's good. It's a good problem to have, I think. I mean, and the, the reality is, is like Christ in that one story isn't going to cover all of the nuance of the entire world. You know what I mean, I think it's like a guiding, a guiding yeah. story, and I think it's like the best, the best way to do things for sure. Um, the real world is more complicated than that. Like there's, but when it comes to like violently killing oppressors and stuff, man, that's hard. But there, like, what's happening in Mexico right now? Um, I should have been more awake to try and talk about this, but basically. It seems like there is sometimes when you're talking about small scale protecting revolutionary spaces that the situation can be a little bit different. <laughs> like mm. if you've got a home base and you're talking about like Rojava or you're talking about specific community defense, sometimes that has included clearing out that area and or the surrounding area of oppressive folks. And it gets, it gets really complicated. Um, it's nice to not have it ever get there. And I don't know, we don't know what would have happened had Jesus stayed along, stayed alive longer. You know, like his last move was martyred, yeah. his, his last move was martyrdom. And then that's been sort of like the, the end of that. That's one path of the end of that, that happened. I don't, it's just, it's, it's hard to talk about. It's more complicated than that. I think whenever you're talking about violently overthrowing a state, though, if you look at how that's gone, especially in the last hundred years, like, violent coups generally do not go well. Like, it, the, the more dangerous, the more violent something gets, the more touchy it gets, the higher the stakes, the easier it can go super wrong. You know what I mean? So it's like, when we're talking about specifically judging other areas and other people in other countries on how they are dealing with their oppressive situations that is so complicated and like left to sort of try and understand that what the, the situation that they're under 
we can't understand everything about why they do things and it's not our place yeah. to judge how that they are dealing with their local problems. When I'm talking about like how we're trying to deal with our problems here in America, I think that sort of this like non-violent framework that does not go past, we should try and avoid at all costs sort of more intensive violence um, because it, it is it can go so badly and you need huge amounts of community support that we don't have. It is kind of like a funny a funny conversation because like um I don't know, so Dean and I are both Marxists and like fine. Um and like this the conversation that we're having is like very purely theoretical or like or it could be a historical conversation. But basically like in terms of praxis in the United States, like it kind of doesn't matter at the moment. <laughs> like <laughs> like like I, I, neither Dean and I are about to go up into the mountains or anything and join like a guerrilla army. Like we're just hanging out, uh, living our living our nice academic lives or whatever. Um, and I, it's funny because like I feel like I can I can easily support like anarchist practice like wherever with no problems at all. Um, but I probably couldn't support uh, actual like Marxist praxis in the United States at the moment. Like like Marxist revolutionary praxis at least it doesn't seem right. So. Um, it's it's funny like I don't know we might have like ideological differences but like I can hang. <laughs> it's part of what's happening right now is like we're on the edge of revolu where like revolutionary shit is happening, so the theory is now relevant and important. You know what I mean? So people sort of sticking to a Marxist framework or sort of like a statist authoritarian violent overthrow framework right now, like that that has implications. So, you know, it, people are still sort of, like, trying really hard not to understand that we're getting to somewhere really serious. <laughs> like, you know, like, we, we, we know that history repeats itself. We know stories of history, but we don't like understanding that we are, we are living history right now, you know. So it's, it's sort of, I'm, you know, part of what I do is try and get people to take this a little bit more seriously, and especially, you know, when I'm talking to people who sort of follow Marxist praxis, you know, are more statist and communist and stuff it's like historically you've got to understand why that's dangerous and like why 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 are you marxist you know what i mean like what is it like what is it i guess what is it about marx specifically that um you like that like i feel like the good stuff about marx is already included in anarchism so the only things that are not anarchist about sort of communist Marxist stuff is for me sort of the less effective badder stuff so I'm not sure what because you all said you <laughs> were anarchist and then now you're kind of more like Marxisty statist so it's like how and why is that yeah uh well Matt and I are, are a bit different um Matt really likes to remind everyone that he's further to the left than me uh in every situation um, <laughs> that's true uh, and Matt is, is totally allowed to wear that badge. Um, it's a good I, badge. Uh, I guess <laughs> it is a good badge. Um, I mean, okay, I'm going to give a dumb answer and then a good answer. Well, okay, I'm going to give it, it could be two dumb answers, but the first <laughs> one is definitely dumb. The, the dumb one, the first dumb one is I am a Marxist because I'm like a Catholic, I think. Uh, so I'm Catholic. Um, my grandparents were Quakers, but uh, my or my great grandparents were Quakers, but my grandma converted, so they won, I guess, um, on that that front. So, uh, you know, I guess problems of like authority and uh, huge anxieties about that. Like, I'm just sort of used to thinking about how authority can be potentially good, mm. and like used to trying to uh, deal with like the historical problems that also come along with that. Like having a complicated religious identity is really natural for me so it is also natural to have like a complicated political identity right um so in that sense i guess it's sort of analogous to how quakerism makes a lot of sense with your anarchism uh it's sort of similar um right. in my own kind of spiritual and political life so that's the dumb answer I'm a, I'm a marxist because i'm catholic uh the the other answer i guess is i feel like um like historically uh marxist revolutions have absolutely been problematic and difficult and full of mistakes and the best marxist revolutionaries are willing to admit that 
Um, obviously, that doesn't save the lives that, in some cases, were unfairly lost. Uh, but nevertheless, it's like an important thing. Um, so I guess for me, like historically, Marxist revolutions have been really inspiring, and in many cases, have been the language through which uh, the oppressed finally found themselves able to speak and organize and sort of build a different world. And they had to defend that through. Uh, building a worker's state in that case. Um, so, you know, for me, I'm not like a hardline statist. Like, I don't know. I really like those parts in Marx where he talks about the state withering away and um, he has this kind of future vision. Um, but the idea is that the state is as a sort of transitional moment. Like, you know, when I look around the world at places like Venezuela or, or Cuba or whatever, um, like those places need these state apparatuses to protect them from huge reactionary violence that's funded by like global capital uh like without those states it's hard to imagine them surviving in the same way or even like uh maybe slightly less marxist uh collectives like the zapatistas they have a kind of like pseudo state thing going on and uh yeah i don't know i guess maybe that's like a long way of getting around it but ultimately i think uh yeah i moved away from my anarchism because i came back to my catholic faith i was an anarchist when i was like an evangelical christian um and then uh, also, I guess, theoretically, like, I, I, the history convinced me, which isn't to say that it's like an absolutely unassailable argument, but that's kind of just how I ended up here. I don't know, Matt, what, what, did, what did it look like for you? Man, if you had a dumb answer and a good answer, I only have a dumb answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess. OK, um. I don't know if I really identify as a status necessarily. I just think that states are things that we have to deal with in some in one way or another. Um, so, yeah, in the Communist Manifesto, Marx has this kind of like famous uh, bit um, about the withering state. That like first you have to take you have to seize seize the state. Like that's um, how you uh, can protect the revolution against external bourgeois forces and internal bourgeois forces, for that matter. Um, but after that, like, there's supposed to be a, like a societal transformation and the state's supposed to wither away. Uh, and I think that is a really nice idea. I like emphasizing that part of Marx when, uh, at least in my own work, my own writing, that's the part of, uh, Marx that I think is really important to remind ourselves of. Um, so I'm Marxist, but I'm not a strong statist. It all kind of reminds me though, uh, of another, another like uh philosopher uh which i don't want to get into it a ton but uh foucault uh michel foucault uh people are familiar probably he's a guy um <laughs> anyways he has this uh there's like this interview that somebody did with him that was a great that's my uh introduction to michel foucault he's, the philosopher. A, guy. he's, he's a, guy. a guy well, well <laughs> <that's accurate. laughs> there's this one yeah <laughs> um there's an interview that someone did with him and they were asking him like, because he, you know, he's talking about prisons and discipline and stuff like that. And he's, he, uh, somebody asked him like, well, should, um, uh, do you think that like the prisoners should take over the prison? And he's like, yeah, absolutely. But like if the prisoners took over the prison and then they left it a prison, I'd be like really disappointed. And I guess I feel the same <laughs> way about the state. Like I, like if, um, if people like rose up and took over the state and it was still the state afterwards, like in all of it's just like, crappy oppressiveness I'd just be really bummed out like what's the point <laughs> uh, well, like, so like why take over the state and not just dismantle it in the first place like why do you need that middle step that can go so wrong uh because there are so many external like forces i guess we see that all over the place um with leftist revolutions well, it's just, uh, it's like the, talking about like the best part being the withering of the way. I'm like, yeah, it's totes. Like that's the anarchist revolution is just making the state is this dual power systems where you then make the state irrelevant. And like that type of anarchist, revo that type of revolution works very, very well where you might still have some semblance of state structures, but they're basically irrelevant to the daily lives of people. Have you read, um, I suggest highly, I tell everybody to read this because it changed my damn life. Um, Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology by David Graeber. Oh, yeah. Yeah, basically, he talks about the two different I types. Not, no. they, they generally, throughout history, there's the two different types where people change, power changes hands or where power goes away. And, like, generally, the ones where power just goes away work much better than the ones where you're trying to change power's hands because power is, power is corrupting. So the idea that you can take over a state and then be sort of benevolent and then let that power go doesn't work because as soon as somebody has power that much power especially the power of any kind of state apparatus it will it will corrupt them 
you know, and so then they're not going to give up the power and the state will only end up trying to eat it, get stronger. The idea that you can just, the state itself will ever, ever dismantle itself, I think is, doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say, uh, Marxism and anarchism are both very young sort of, uh, theoretical and practical traditions. Um, it's, it's also hard to say in a world where like capitalism is a major extremely dominating force that sabotages anyone trying to do anything good (laughs) (laughs) marxists or anarchists uh and that's too bad um yeah i don't know i mean um probably there's like a billion more things we could say about this uh and we should say about it um dang we should do another episode uh i'm gonna say that absolutely we should do that and prepare for it a little more um but in the interest of time, I'm just looking at uh, how close we are. I do want to get back to this Magnificat thing, if the two of you are down, uh, to chat about that a little bit. Um, if you want to just totally switch gears and pull out the rug uh, from this conversation. Uh, here's the thing about the Magnificast. We're like masters at not tra- not uh, transferring to new topics very well. It's kind of like our brand. Uh, <laughs> just um, so n- now you're a victim of one of them, I'm sorry to say. Uh, <laughs> But, um, yeah, so is that cool? Can we, like, uh, can we bracket the <laughs> the very important, like, anarchism-Marxism uh, debate for uh, a, a future time and uh, move to something we can all agree on, which is that Mary is super cool? I mean, that fucking debate's, like, <laughs> very old and has gone on forever and ever, so I don't think that debate's gonna go away anytime soon. We could definitely, we could spend the rest of our lives debating <laughs> that, probably, so I think being able to cut it off at any point is totally fair. <laughs> <laughs> we we appreciate um, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh cool. Um all right, so there's this passage, a uh, famous passage that in some traditions like mine and others is called the Magnificat. It's Mary's uh, song of praise is how some bibles like put a little nice little heading over it. Um so it's found in Luke 1 and it's 46 to 55. Um it's pretty good. I don't know if you guys have your uh, your Bibles in front of you or your handy dandy computers. Um, and Mary said the Mac- Magnificat. There it is. Oh yeah, yeah. There you have it. Um, okay. Well, I I, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, Catherine, but I feel like um, probably neither Matt nor I should probably read like a, a passage <laughs> said by Mary after yeah. she's called like blessed among all women uh so would you be down to introduce that for us sure yeah does it go all the way through 56 is that Uh, yeah down to uh 54 like it ends at 55 55 okay sure yeah my soul doth magnify the lord and my spirit hath rejoiced in god my savior for he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden for behold from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed for he that is mighty hath done to me great things and holy is his name and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his, with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent away empty. Sent empty away. <laughs> he hath holpen his servant Israel <laughs> in remembrance of his mercy as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Cool, thank you. Nice. Pretty good. A couple messes up. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's good. <laughs> One take. Yeah. It's a good take. It was a good take. Thanks. Um, cool. cool. So uh, uh, so uh, the name of our podcast is The Magnificast, and it's kind of a play off of um, this uh, bit in the Bible where Mary says some very... Uh, very neat things that I think resonate with um, both anarchist and Marxist uh, thinkers uh, for sure. Um, it's especially a, a great time of year to read this bit because it's Advent and it's kind of in the church calendar. Uh, if any, if anyone that listens to this uh, cares or knows about the church calendar, <laughs> uh, it's Advent. This is, when you, this is when you read this. This is when this this reading comes up in your church. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know about your church. Um, anyways. Uh, this is a really interesting, um, and I think powerful verse, uh, just because it's so strong in its rhetoric and, uh, it so explicitly talks about, uh, what God thinks 
<laughs> about the rich and the powerful in the world, and also what God thinks about the poor and the hungry. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. So what do you guys think? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like, listen to that. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. It's pretty, um... How does how do prosperity gospel people get away with thinking that? I don't get it. <laughs> like that seems like like how do you uh, read yeah, that and be know. like actually though actually though rich people though you know like what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah they gotta That's cut true. this part out of their Bible. Like and the rich he hath sent empty away. That's like pretty specific. <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> sending rich... rich people away empty is so good. I really like that a lot. Uh, I like it because it's not like, oh, and then he, I don't know, told the rich to, like, share their wealth or uh, redistribute things or maybe just, like, think about your employees and give them benefits every once in a while. It's like, no, they just go away with nothing. Like, like that's that actually what happens. happens. Just <laughs> fuck right Bible. off. Just fuck right off. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. That's actually what they should call this in the Bible. Like, instead of Mary's song of praise, it should just be headed with fuck right off. Yeah, I'm into it. I mean, basically, what, like, me, my favorite parable, I mean, my favorite part is probably gleaning the grain. Obvi- you know, when, I mean, the rich young man is the parable of the, is the, not the yeah. parable. Yeah. The, it's the story of the rich young man where Jesus is just like, fuck that guy. And everyone's like, whoa, Jesus, he's not that bad. And he's like, no, dude, he fucking is awful. It's the best. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, totally. But y'all are good. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, this is obviously so great and awesome for us, but I think like what's kind of uh, dumb is just um, a lot of Christian traditions have like a history of reading this kind of bit here, um, along with other bits like the rich young ruler uh, as being like really metaphorical. Like, oh, well, the rich just means like, you know, the rich in spirit or something. something. Uh, <laughs> or, <laughs> and, and, um, but but I think it's, like, always good to get back that good materialist reading that I think only anarchists and Marxists can actually do because uh, uh, we're people who think about intersecting, like, class identities. Um, so, I don't know. Um, I guess I just want to emphasize how important it is that we read this and uh, don't, don't think and get confused about what the word rich means in these uh, or the powerful means. Um, or, the, you know, the mighty from their thrones probably doesn't mean people who are just feeling really good about themselves or something metaphorically <laughs> yeah. might, might yeah. mean actually, actually the powerful them. from the thrones right exactly totally yeah the way people kind of like try and bend it is they people will tie themselves in knots to keep their power and money legit legitimized it's like you know it's like you have to really bend it's like well the language is really old it's like i'm reading king james right now like it's english you know like it's still the words <laughs> that mean the things that the words mean you know <laughs> yeah yeah uh this speaking of that kind of like deep materialist analysis too that brings out what these words mean uh i get so pumped when i think about this uh passage because i don't know like the more i think about it the more the crazier it gets because mary is a peasant woman who is people think that like maybe she's kind of loose like in a you know uh-huh. Uh, I don't know why. Why do you have a kid when you're not married? That's no good. And like some biblical commentators have suggest, like maybe she got raped or whatever. Like there's all kinds of really wild things going on behind there. So that's already crazy. Like she's this peasant woman uh, in a really vulnerable position mm-hmm. in an already oppressed and occupied territory where like her people aren't respected and not allowed to determine themselves. Uh, and like you know, just a few decades before all this happens, like. The Jewish people tried to have a massive, violent insurrection, and they, like, kind of succeeded a little bit for a while. Um, Happy Hanukkah, everybody. Uh, Like, (laughs) that's so insane that, like, this is the kind of thing that kind of opens up Luke's gospel, right? Like, the the very first chapter is this peasant woman in occupied Israel uh, after, you know, all these revolutionary energies have kind of died down, being like, well, actually, just you wait. Like, something, something wild's gonna happen. That's so awesome. Yeah, I love the feminist um, bent to to the Bible, to the New Testament especially. I mean, to the Bible in general, but, um, you know, I was just reading, I was just reading over Matthew again just the other day and being like, man, all the disciples, like, all the guys just, like, run away and are like, eh, and, like, all that's left are the women to just stay and do everything as per <laughs> usual, you know, like, they, they, know, they don't abandon, you know, like, they're there, they're doing all the things, and it's like, I love that, it's, like, pretty clear, it's like, the women are 
awesome and you guys need to get it together. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, I don't know, like, there's also one, there's one book that I always try to go to anytime I read a, a biblical passage. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is a really weird book called The Gospel in Salentiname. Uh, I don't speak Spanish, so sorry, all of you, for probably butchering that. But it is edited by a guy named Ernesto Cardinal, who is, he was a Roman Catholic priest, um, but he ended up uh, being part of the Nicaraguan Sandinista Revolution. And before that happened, he just, like, read the Bible with a bunch of peasants in Nicaragua and just recorded what they said about it. And it's the weirdest book, because it's all these peasants just, like, reading the Bible and coming up with, like, the the most fun and like wild interpretations of it. <laughs> uh, so naturally, like I had to look up what they said about the Magnificat mm-hmm. and uh, I don't know. Is it cool if I just like uh, share some of that? Cause I think it is the neatest thing. Yeah. Awesome. Do it. Sounds cool. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, Ernesto says, I asked what they thought Herod would have said if he had known that a woman of the people had sung that God had pulled down the mighty and raised up the humble, filled the hungry with good things and left the rich with nothing. Natalia laughed and said, he'd probably say she was crazy. Rosita says, uh, probably that she was a communist. (laughs) And Loriano says, the point isn't that they would just say that the Virgin was a communist. She was a communist. Uh, (laughs) And what would they say in Nicaragua if they heard uh, what we're saying here in Salentiname? And then several people say in unison that we're communists. And someone asked, uh, that part about filling the hungry with good things? Another person answers, the hungry are going to eat. Uh, and another, the revolution. And then Loriano again says, that is the revolution. The rich person or the mighty is brought down, and the poor person, the one who was down, is raised up. Mm-hmm. And then another, if God is against the mighty, then he has to be on the side of the poor. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Andrea, Oscar's wife, asked, that promise that the poor would have those good things, was it for them, for then, for Mary's time, or would it happen in our own time? I ask because I don't know. And then one of the young people answered, she spoke for the future, it seems to me, because we are just barely beginning to see the liberation that she announces. I think that's so awesome. Oh, that's I mean, what these peasants, peasants got, got out of just reading, just reading that, that song. song. Yeah, I and mean, that's one of the things I like about anarchism is it's, um, it's understanding and wonder and respect for the peasant class, you know? Uh, yeah. Peasants know their shit. For sure. And just sort of like, this is like, Mary is the peasant class, you know? She's not, she's not, the, bouge- she's not the working class, really, you know? She's, she's a peasant. Um, and yeah, I, I want to say real quick that like, I really appreciate you using the Magnificat and like lifting that up as the, as sort of the founding piece of your podcast. And then, um, when it's, when it's Mary, you know, and then I was really impressed that you wanted me to read it. I don't know. That just was like, I'm just, thank you. Like, that's beautiful. I really, I really appreciate that of all the parts of the Bible you could have chosen, that that's something that you see as specifically really important. And it's from Mary. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's really good. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it is really good. That's true. Yeah. Story. It's like hard, hard to find, to find a, a cooler, a cooler, cooler part. part. Um, I think, I think that I like it so much too, because, um, I I remember reading this in the past and just being kind of struck by it uh, in the sense that like, okay, so uh, I grew up like in an evangelical church and that's like a whole thing that does, does something um, I think bad to you. But um, I I mean, just like growing up, I had this like incredibly like um, immaterial understanding of the world and what it meant to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. Um, But I like the Magnificat because like, it gives a real materiality to what you're actually talking about when you go to church or when you think about Jesus or anything else in the sense that like the good news doesn't just mean that like Jesus forgives you of your sins, but the good news might mean that like the, like the poor person gets to eat. (laughs) Yeah. Like, uh, that there's, that there's an actual materiality. There's something connected to this. That's more than just like, you know, Jesus being your best friend or whatever, which is like, I guess great, but there's, there's just more going on here. And, um, every time I read it, I am reminded and I like it. Yep. Yep. It's so funny. My, um, the new Testament I'm holding, I has to have this little purse sized new Testament and it's a little red book. <laughs> oh nice. yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> uh, that is what I want now. Gotta That's get my hands on that. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, they're actually in like the 60s or 70s. Uh, this is a whole dumb aside, but there was this book that this Catholic priest published. I can't remember the name of it now, but it's called something like uh, The Sayings of Chairman Jesus. And it's just like a reimagining of uh, Jesus's parables um, using like lefty 60s, 70s Blind language. And it's like published as like a little red book. I've seen it in used bookstores. It's so funny. Whoa. Whoa. Awesome. I want that. <laughs> that sounds amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, that sounds really cool. <laughs> yeah, it's good. I'm, I'm sure. sure it's like used somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, we should probably like wrap this up for now, uh, but I uh, hope that we can kind of see this as one in uh, many future conversations. This is so fun and encouraging, and it was just really great, Catherine, to hear a little bit about your story. And like you said in the very beginning, it can feel kind of lonely being a lefty Christian type. So yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's really nice to hear that you're out there doing uh, really good work. It's just really uplifting to know that there are people that feel like in any way similar to us or have like a similar outlook on the world. That's so it's so cool. It is. It's really encouraging. Like it felt um, kind of weird and lonely when I first found found Christ because I was an anarchist. I'm like, this is really, really weird. I don't even know if this exists. I don't know if this is a thing that you can do <laughs> as be a leftist Christian. Is that even a thing? And like, I wasn't totally sure. And now, I'm, but now through this project, I'm finding people like you. And it is, it's really, it's really encouraging. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thanks yeah, so much. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we would love to have you back. Uh, yeah. Good, good luck uh, with your next projects for, for sure. sure. Thank you. You too. Thanks for listening to the joint episode of the Magnificast and Friendly Anarchism. Um, thanks for listening. It was a really cool conversation. Um, I hope that we get to do it again. It was such a cool perspective that usually uh, we don't hear from because, I don't know, because we're Marxists. But it's good. Um, cool. So you should go out and subscribe to Friendly Anarchism. Uh, link, like them on iTunes. Or subscribe to them on iTunes. Subscribe to them on SoundCloud. Uh, follow them on Twitter. Uh, same same goes for the Magnificast. Do all those things to us as well. Uh, cool. So uh, it's really important, I think, that uh, all of us good leftist podcasts and even good leftist Christian podcasts uh, can sort of support one another. So definitely uh, get get at them. Don't sleep on these podcasts. They're all good. Make your own. <laughs> yeah, make your own for sure. That's such a good idea. Uh, cool. Well, thanks for listening. Get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord. Jackson, keep your hoods up. Keep your hoods up